talk about the 1919 Boston police strike. Um, that's right. The the police in Boston um, had a strike. This is the only police strike uh, in the history of possibly the world. I'm not sure, but but America for sure. This is the only police strike that ever happened, um, and we'll get into why. Let's get into to why. We have our handy dandy notes. Um, so this this uh, if you guys remember, since we're talking about strikes a whole lot. I did a whole series on uh, a couple of different strikes that happened in 1919, right? Uh, first, the, the Seattle general strike happened in 1919 uh, in January, February. That only lasted about five days. Uh, we had a six-week strike in Winnipeg uh, that happened between May and June. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the beginning of that was moral defeat then uh the moral defeat didn't work in winnipeg so they just resorted to violence um and uh, and that kind of squashed that general strike but it did it did help them get closer to collective bargaining um and so we arrive here in boston um after after the seattle general strike after the winnipeg general strike where this is all kind of moving a little bit more east right um so the, all, all of a sudden, a bunch more strikes are starting to pop up in Boston, right? You had um, textile workers, phone operators, railway workers. Uh, they all started striking, and, and a bunch of them started winning. A bunch of them started, uh, you know, they were, they were uh, striking so hard that they actually uh, started to win, and they were actually doing better for themselves. They were getting the pay increases that they wanted to. They were getting... Um, better work conditions uh, that they wanted to, uh, except for the Boston police. Uh, and the Boston police uh, were, in the city of Boston in 1919, were some of the lowest paid workers uh, that year. And inflation was going up because this was also, you know, uh, coming out of the heels of World War I. Um, and, uh, you know, it, there, there was a lot of inflation, but no, nobody was getting a pay increase um, because of that. So, so rents were going up, costs of everything were going up, um, and you know the Boston police remained to be some of the lowest paid people in the city of Boston. So they were making fourteen hundred dollars a year, fourteen hundred dollars a year, which equates to roughly twenty three thousand six hundred dollars a year today. So somebody making like an annual salary of $23,600. The first graphic design job I ever got was in 2011. And um, I was paid uh, to begin with $20,000 a year. And then um, six months later, $25,000 a year. And then when I got a raise, I went from $25,000 to $25,000, uh, 25000 Two hundred dollars. I got a two hundred dollar uh, annual pay increase, uh, which was all terrible. Like I wish I would have been a little bit more um, knowledgeable about unions and strikes and things of that sort. Uh, but uh, <laughs> you know, these guys are being paid less than that. These guys are being these guys were being paid less than an entry level graphic designer. Um, today. So, and, and they were, and, and the work conditions were significantly worse, uh, than, than the work conditions that I was in, um, at that time, right. They were working 72 to 98 hours in a week. Uh, that's over four days. So it, you know, if you're looking at a seven day, uh, work week, they were virtually working a little over four days sometimes, um, out of the week, just straight through. Right. Um, they would get one day off every other day of the week, um, or one day off every other week. Sorry, uh, jumble that up a little bit. Uh, and in, in or, and on that day off, let's say they wanted to go to like New Hampshire or they wanted to go to Vermont or something, they would have to get special permission from the commissioner um, to approve their leave, to approve them leaving, right? And uh, they also lived in the station in terrible unsanitary conditions like it was just a bunch of dudes sleeping in one room sharing one bathroom um you know so they were just living in like piss poor conditions not being paid a whole lot being completely overworked um and 
they were kind of being treated like like a really shitty version of the military, right? This was like the this this was like the short end of the stick when it comes to militarizing the police. Um, so the the commissioner, the mayor, and the governor of Massachusetts were all against uh, unionizing the police force, and all three of them kind of gave the same kind of rhetoric, right? They all kind of gave the same rhetoric of. Um, well, this is Bolshevism. This is communism. This is the Russian Revolution coming to our doorstep. Um, this is people uh, trying to take down American capitalism, take your freedoms away. Uh, you know, this is a, and they and they went into like the xenophobic racist attack of like, oh, all these foreigners are influencing our police. They're making um, they're making everybody look bad. Uh, they're making all the police look like a bunch of assholes and they're they're making the police turn against American capitalism, you know. So all of this sort of propaganda was coming out of uh, the commissioner, the mayor and the governor's office uh, against the police saying that we want to unionize so we can we can be at the negotiating table and negotiate for something better, negotiate for better work conditions, negotiate for better pay because we're working long hours, we're protecting the city of Boston, we're overworked, we're underpaid, we're exhausted. Um, and, um, you know, um, what are we going to do? Like, uh, we, we want to unionize and we want to get together and, uh, um, you know, uh, push forward. And, and, the, and the mayor and the commissioner and the governor were like, no, you can't do that because uh, Russia. Right. Um, which is very similar to today is anytime that, that anybody says anything uh, oppositional to the um, to the mainstream conversation, to the establishment conversation, um, you know, they they kind of put it to this red scare tactic. And initially, you would think that the red scare tactic goes uh, back into the 50s and 60s with the McCarthyism and everything. But it really goes even further than that. Um, really we're seeing the red scare tactic being used in the late 1800s to early 1900s, really pushing into the early 1900s. Um, and the Boston police did have some kind of a, a union. They had a Boston social club, uh, which wasn't really a union. It did allow them to organize together and discuss issues that they had, but that's really about it. That's really about it. You know, they, um, they, they got together and they would discuss the problems that they were having within the thing, but they weren't able to come up with any viable solutions. They weren't able to come to the negotiating table um, and and collectively bargain. And this was before, I, I, I think this was really before collective bargaining became like a, a big part of the, um, of, of the union nomenclature. Um, I might be wrong about this. Uh, and if I am, leave a comment. Um, but I believe that collective bargaining really became part of the bigger conversation when it came to unions and the labor movement in like maybe the thirties. That's when they were, that's when they were, uh, legitimized by the establishment, let's call it. Um, you know, like the general strike of 1934 in San Francisco, uh, that brought collective bargaining to the forefront of that conversation. Whereas right now in 1919, that's not really happening a whole lot. They're not really, um, saying that unions are, are legitimate still. So um, the commissioner, uh, well, especially the mayor and the governor were saying that uh, the police can't form a union because they're not quote unquote employees. Uh, they are state officers. And then commissioner Curtis um, basically like gave the stamp of approval and he said, yes, they're not employees, they're state officers, uh, so they can't unionize. They have to do what the state tells them to do. Um, and there's something specifically that the, the commissioner said, um, we'll go to the screen share thing here, that I want to read to you guys. Uh, this was a quote uh, that, that Commissioner Curtis said. He, uh, he said, it is or should be apparent to any thinking person that the police department of this and any other city cannot fulfill its duty to the entire public if its mem members are subject to the direction of an organization existing outside the department. 
if troubles and disturbances arise where the interests of this organization and the interests of other elements and classes in the community conflict the situation immediately arises, which always arises when a man attempts to serve two masters. He must either fail his duty as a policeman or in his obligation to the organization that controls him. Um, we're kind of talking about them being obligated to the to the unions is basically what they're saying. Um, he they would be they would be obligated to the unions and people in general. And uh, and Commissioner Curtis sees that being a problem because you can't be, uh, you, you know, you can't be um, obliged to the public and to the unions. Uh, and I would say that they kind of are doing this in a different sense. Right. Uh, they're, they're kind of doing this in a different sense, because right now uh, in our society, we see the police being used as a private military force to protect corporations. We saw that in North Dakota. We see that in New Orleans. We see that anywhere where there is a pipeline, anywhere where there's fossil fuel protests, um, cops get called uh, to protect the interests of a corporation rather than the interests of the people. Uh, so it is the people's right to peaceably assemble. It is the people's right to protest something. Um, and corporations being linked directly to the government uh, under Citizens United, basically giving corporations the ability to pay into the government to legislate on their behalf, means that the, the, the cops are now being used to protect corporations, which means that they're serving two masters. They should be serving the public. But now they're serving the corporations because they're being paid by the government who's being paid by the corporations. So, you know, this is just transit of property. So what Commissioner Curtis is saying is actually in in application today. Um, the unions, in my opinion, the unions would be um, or should be in theory. Um, and I think in practice, in, in certain cases, uh, to... People, like they're they're an organization that brings the working class into the into the negotiating table, and so they would be represented by people. Like it's people representing people, kind of thing. Um, so the police force being unionized and serving the union would de facto be serving the public in and of itself, being that the union is 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 comprised of people, right? Like that's sort of the argument that I would make um, to go against Commissioner Curtis's point uh that you're serving two masters and you can't have a police union that serves the general public and it uh, has the interests of the unions in mind so i think i think he's wrong now throughout all this while while commissioner curtis is making these statements the mayor the mayor of boston was on an extended vacation oh la di da huh fucking cops have to buy their own uniforms too, by the way. That was another thing. The cops in, in Boston had to purchase their own uniform, uh, which was, which, um, uh, because they should have multiple uniforms. Um, they spent like 200 bucks a year on uniforms. Uh, so, you know, uh, kind of, uh, kind of, kind of shitty thing to do. But so while the cops are struggling there and they're overworked, the mayor's like, I'm going to take another week off. I've earned it. I've earned this week off. You know, I'm going to be in Rhode Island for a bit. I'm going to be fishing. Uh, I might go. I might go look for some whales. Um, so, <laughs> while well, all this shit's going on, <laughs> the mayor's just like, maybe I'll go to Vermont, you know? <laughs> maybe, 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 maybe I'll go look for some moose in the woods. I don't know. Seems like the right thing to do. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, governor Calvin Coolidge, Calvin Coolidge is the governor of Massachusetts at this point, um, who later becomes president. We'll get into that in a second. Governor Coolidge's attorney general, um, claims that, uh, the police, if the police unionize, then, uh, they, they would have the government by the throat. He, he says that uh, he says that the police has them uh, by the throat for wanting wanting to unionize, saying that uh, they need to unionize to better serve the public. So they're 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 choking them, they're choking them to for for their basic human rights, <laughs> which is like what the fuck? It's like you're asking me to treat you 
like a real human being so that you can do your job more effectively and protect the public without being overworked, exhausted, and being paid properly. And you are choking us, but you are torturing us. You are taking the air out of our lungs. How dare you, you insensitive bastards. <laughs> this, is, this is how sociopaths talk. This is how sociopaths talk. Human rights is a threat of violence for sociopaths. That's what it is. So um, while all this negotiating is happening throughout the, the springtime, right? Winnipeg is, is striking at this point. General strikes going on. Um, while that's happening, the mayor of Boston extended vacation. The attorney general is saying that asking for unions is choking them out. Uh, we arrive at August, on August 20th, 1919, uh, eight lead union organizations, union organizers uh, from the police. The police do organize and create a union for themselves. Uh, they all get suspended. All eight of the organizers get suspended. And, uh, and the 11 people that supported um, the, the union organizers also get suspended. They also get suspended from it. So... Uh, the American Labor Federation, the uh, the or the American Federation of Labor (AFL), uh, I wrote it wrong in my notes here. Uh, tried to step in, right? They they were like, "We'll represent the unions. We'll 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 absorb. We'll we'll make the police union a part of the AFL." Um, and Commissioner Curtis and, and the mayor said that no, um, we don't we don't recognize the police union, especially if they join the AFL. Uh, we're not going to recognize them. We think that they should be independent. Um, and then they offered them like a small, tiny raise. Um, and, uh, and then the government, uh, the, the governor also did the same thing. They also offered a small, tiny raise. Um, and the reason why they even conceded to offering them a small, tiny raise is, is there was some banker uh, that, was, that was like, hey, I support the police union. Um, I think we, the police should be unionized. I think we should be talking to them um, about paying them better. Uh, we should be giving, you know, we should be trying to figure out how the government can pay for the uniforms. Um, and, and we should be talking about, um, you know, better hours, better living conditions for them, uh, because they are protecting our public. They are doing a, a public service for us. They are putting their lives on the line. So this rich banker comes out on their side. And all of a sudden they go, well, we should probably give them something. So they give them these pittance and they do this twice. Um, and it should also be noted that there are five newspapers in Boston um, and four out of five of them are for the police union. They do, they do support the police union. So there, so in the beginning, there seems to be a lot of support for the police to unionize. The bankers supporting them, four out of five of the newspapers are supporting them. They're saying that this is the right thing to do. Um, that, you know, they, they should be protected. Um, and Governor Coolidge and Mayor Peters, um, that's the, the mayor's name, basically were like, we'll give you a pittance. Is this pittance okay? And the police union goes, no, we also don't want to be independent. We might, we might go and join the AFL because the AFL seems to be taking us more seriously than you guys are. And we want to be at the negotiating table. We deserve to be treated better. Um, so eventually... On September 8th, uh, the 1,136 members of the police union voted for a strike. Uh, 1,134 of the members voted for the strike. Uh, two voted against it. So, I mean, this was virtually unanimous at this point. Like, basically everybody wanted uh, to, to strike because they thought that this was the right direction to go. And then on September 9th, at 5.45 p.m., uh, the Boston police went on strike. They just went on strike. And um, that happened when 72% of the police force didn't show up to work, right? They just didn't show up to work. Um, and so Governor Coolidge was like, well, we got to fucking do something. This is kind of crazy. So he calls in 100 Metropolitan Park police and then 58 of them refused to participate. They, they also joined in solidarity with the strikers. And so, so those 58 that joined the strikers got suspended, right? And, and now it's like um, there, there's less than, you know, uh, so what, what is that? 42. There's 42 Metropolitan Park Police and um, 
handful of Boston police that are trying to, you know, enforce law and order throughout the entire city of Boston in 1919. Um, so uh, Governor Coolidge is freaking out. Mayor Peters is freaking out. Uh, Commissioner Curtis is freaking out because they're like, what the fuck do we do? And it turns out the establishment, not so great at organizing. Not so great at coming up with plans. <laughs> Maybe um, if the government understood how union organizers did their jobs, they would be able to organize a little bit better. <laughs> so uh, the evening of September 9th, the entire city of Boston is virtually left unprotected, right? Virtually left uh, unprotected. And uh, people start to kind of get a little nervous. Uh, September 10th, um, the propaganda starts hitting in, in full gear because all the papers, remember these papers, four out of five of them supported them. Uh, now all the papers that supported them are reporting things like uh, the strikers are deserters and they are agents of Lenin. I mean, this would be like today's equivalent of calling somebody like a Putin puppet because you don't agree with what they're saying or because they're like, hey, um, I think this presidential candidate is a sexual assaulter and here's some proof. And they're like, Putin puppet. Uh, and you're like, hey, I think this super rich guy um, that has these insane sort of fetishy corporate uh, rules and also owns a newspaper, a cybersecurity company, CIA contracts, and a grocery store, um, is a sociopath that needs to treat his employees better. And you're like, ah, Putin puppet. You know, like that's basically the equivalent of, of what's going on here. They called them deserters, essentially traitors to the country um, for asking to be treated better. Um, you know, and um, so by September 10th, the evening of September 10th, during the daytime, everything was fine. The evening of September 10th, one day after the strike begins, uh, the city just erupts into chaos. Right. Like people realize that the cops aren't around and they just start looting. There's like hooliganism. People are like gambling on the streets. There's prostitution everywhere. It's just like mayhem all over the place. Right. And uh, so like the governor's like freaking out. <laughs> he doesn't know what to do. Uh, he gets like Harvard kids. This is the same thing that happened in 1919, too, by the way. It's like the minus the hooliganism. Uh, the, 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 the Seattle 1919 strike did not really turn violent. Um, but, uh, Oli Hansen, who was the, the mayor of Seattle, who's, who's like praised for his, his, uh, his actions at this point, um, gave, deputized a bunch of like university kids. So that's what Mayor Peters does. <laughs> and Governor Coolidge does is they deputize a bunch of Harvard kids, and they were like, hey, you guys seem fine. You guys could have some guns. Go have a good time. Uh, the, the state guard gets called. The Massachusetts state guard gets called uh, because they're freaking out. And really the height of the violence um, ends up in, in a place called Scully, Scully Square. I think I'm pronouncing that properly. Um, uh, is Scully Square where... Um, the state guard and the, uh, the basically killed uh, eight eight civilians, and it was basically like any law that they were breaking. Like if they were gambling, they just fired on them. Like you are uh, you're breaking and entering into a store, kablamo, you're dead. Um, and all of the people that were doing this were like kids, right? They were like between the ages of like 20 and 25. They were just kids being fucking dumb kids because they're like, oh, well, cops don't exist. We could do whatever the fuck we want. Freedom, Where? you know, like this, which is like human behavior, you know, like, like, you know what happened? Like the first time your parents are like, we're going to leave you alone in the house. Here's $40 for the pizza. And you're just like, let's bring everybody. How much cocaine can $40 get me? And then, you know, like your house erupts into flames. And your parents are like, well, we obviously can't leave you alone um, in the house uh, by yourself. Uh, also, how did this cocaine get here? And, you know, like that's so that's kind of what what's happening. Um, and had you let people kind of just. I'm not I don't I don't know if this is the right way to go about doing this, but like, had you just kind of let them loot and riot for like a day? I bet the following day they would have been like, oh, this doesn't seem like it's very productive. 
you know, like in like two or three days, it would have been like, I think I'm bored of just gambling and fucking in the streets constantly. I kind of, maybe I should help <laughs> help my fellow man out. Uh, and, and, and like people would have determined their own law and order. They would have just figured it out themselves. Um, but instead, um, you know, eight people got shot and killed. Uh, a bunch were wounded. Um, and then I think there were two or th two or three deaths um, that came from like citizens firing upon themselves. Uh, so like, you know, like a looter would come into a store and uh, the store owner would shoot them and kill them. Like there was one particular case where like a 20 year old kid was breaking into uh, like a mechanic shop or something and he broke in and the owner was there and, and the owner shot him and, and, you know, so, so this was, uh, this was like, you know, the height of the violence. It, it's the first night. Um, chaos is broken loose. The state guard is called a uh, Harvard kids are fucking, you know, deputized. And, uh, and within that night they do, um, uh, roughly $35,000 in damages, which if you translate it to today, uh, was five hundred ninety one thousand dollars in damages? That's a lot of fucking money. So, so basically, the entire city sued the city. It's the the. Um, how do I want to to phrase this? Uh, the the citizens and business owners of the city uh, sued the city of Boston itself for these damages, um, and I think I think the city of Boston paid back like thirty four thousand dollars. Uh, out of thirty-five thousand um, dollars in damages, so around September eleventh and September twelfth, in in the frame of those two days, uh, the AFL wanted to call uh, call a general strike, but they didn't. They were kind of reluctant, and they went back and forth, and they were like, "Ah, eh, we sh we should, because it seems like it's the right thing to do." You know, it'll shut down the city, kind of like what happened in Seattle, kind of like what happened in Winnipeg. But man, with this this thing, because it was particularly cops, we this thing escalated so quickly. Um, it's going to really seem like uh, we're calling for more violence with this general strike, uh, and we're going to get bad press. And it basically ended uh, with the AFL on September twelfth uh, asking all of the workers to just return. Um, the 1500 police that, that went on strike over the course of, what was it? Four days, um, were replaced. They got fired and, uh, um, they were replaced with 1100 out of work veterans from world war one. And then here's the bullshit of it all, right? This is the bullshit of it all. The 1100, the 1100 veterans that were hired, um, were paid better, were given a better living conditions, were given bigger pensions, um, and, and they were, uh, you know, uh, they were just given, basically, they met the demands that the police were asking for, and they just gave it to replacement workers, which just shows me that, like, this is more of an action of callous than it was anything else. Like, it was, it like, it, it just shows that Governor Coolidge Mayor Peters and Commissioner Curtis are more callous individuals than they are anything else. This was a big fuck you to the strikers. This was a big fuck you to say, how dare you ask us for um, to, to, to treat you like, like you're, you know, regular people, like to give you basic human rights. How dare you ask us that? You know what? We're going to give these other people that, you know why? Cause they didn't ask it from us. And, and we're, and it was just a big fuck you to them because at this point it basically proves that, um, that the city and the government had the money to do this. They had the money to give them the raise. They had the money to treat them a little bit better. And they had the money to probably hire uh, more cops so that they were working less hours, so that there was more, you know, patrolmen on the beat. Uh, it, and, and it gives an opportunity where you have this huge unemployment gap that a bunch of veterans could have been hired to, to help the police force. Um, so it shows that there was an infrastructure in place, but there was a reluctancy by Governor Coolidge, by Mayor Peters, and Commissioner Curtis to do this. And it shows the cops that if you go against the establishment, if you go against the masters, which the masters were um, Commissioner Curtis and Mayor Peters, specifically for the city of Boston, because 
part of this thing was Mayor Peters felt like he didn't have control over the cops, right? Um, they, he was just like, I don't, I don't feel like I'm completely connected with the cops. So he basically, um, you know, had to buddy buddy with the commissioner, and he did. And the commissioner and the mayor kind of teamed up together, and they and they fucked over these working cops, these blue collar police officers. So this is what the establishment does when the the police go against them. When the police sit there and say, "Well, what you're doing isn't right," they treat them uh, like secondhand citizens. They tr they they run a bunch of smear campaigns against them, where the papers are calling them deserters and agents of Lenin, whatever. The f which which is like, what does that mean? That means that what they're they're a bunch of people that are asking for working class rights. They're they're standing up for for the for for their actual basic human rights. That and so so they're agents of somebody now, like you know so. It just means that the, these these people in the, in in the government top down are just callous fucking people. That's all that means. So they still had to these these um, eleven hundred um, veterans that became cops still had to go get their own uniforms because the state and the city wasn't going to help them out and provide them with 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 uniforms. And the United Garment Workers refused to make these people uniforms because they were standing in solidarity with the 1,500 cops that uh, that went on strike, right? <laughs> um, so these cops had to report in civilian clothing because they just, <laughs> like, they didn't have a uniform to report in. So this was all um, September, October, uh, and by December 21st, 1919, the State Guard was relieved of duty uh, because they finally got the numbers of cops up, which, again, same thing, right? Like, they had the opportunity to give the cops a, a appropriate pay raise. They had the opportunity of hiring more police officers um, to help reduce the number of hours these cops have to work. Uh, and improve the conditions and give them a better pension. And if the idea is that these cops are meant to serve the public, to keep the law and order in place, why would you not help them do that by reducing, you know, um, exhaustion, by reducing the stresses that they already have to face, right? Isn't that the logical thing to do? And instead, Governor Coolidge was like, "No, no, no! Asking for that. If you want to, if you want to reduce stress, if you want to have like basic human rights, that's communism, and that goes against freedom. What freedom is is having less, uh, f less money for like way more work. That's freedom. You guys don't get it because you guys are like poor and stupid. I'm rich, so uh, obviously super smart, uh, and that's how they treated these cops." So the media reaction after all this was largely negative. Um, huge, largely negative. I'm going to make sure I find the right quote here uh, from, from old Coolidge, if I can find it. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, Governor Coolidge, oh boy, Governor Coolidge, um, said that a, uh, this is a Democrat, by the way, or, or I'm sorry, this is not Governor Coolidge. I made a mistake here. Uh, this is Democrat Woodrow Wilson. This is the president. The president of the United States is making the statement uh, about cops trying to unionize, right? He basically said that any cop that tries to unionize is committing a crime against civilization. That's what they think about cops unionizing to be at the negotiating table. So that working class police officers that are meant to protect the public that are asking for better work conditions and better compensation for the amount of work that they do for the stress that they have to go through so they can better do that job and and actually better serve the public are committing a crime against civilization i mean you know you don't get that kind of bold leadership everywhere and by the way i wrote bold leadership and then i uh, I, I drew a penis because that's what i think of um, woodrow wilson uh, I think that he's sort of a, a limp, drippy penis. That's what I think about him. Um, but <laughs> here's here's the direct quote that I want to read for you guys. Uh, this is actually from Coolidge. 
that's why I got confused because I pulled up the Coolidge quote, uh, and I, and before that I, I had the uh, Woodrow Wilson thing in my notes. The, but this is Coolidge, right? Coolidge called them deserters. He called them traitors. Um, and uh, he this is, he said uh, when we were uh, or I'm sorry, what is this? Uh, this is the response that uh, the, the I think the Union people made. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, this is a response that the union people made. Sorry about the little bit of a disorganization on this part. This is like new technology. So I'm kind of trying to figure out how to coordinate my notes and this thing together. Uh, it said, when we were honorably discharged from the United States Army, we were hailed as heroes, saviors of this country. We returned to our duties on the police force of Boston. Now, through only a few months, uh, now only a few months have passed. We were denounced as deserters, as traitors to our city and violators of our oath of office. The first men to raise the cry were those who have always opposed to giving uh, to labor a living wage. It has taken up by the newspapers who cared little for real facts. You finally added your word of condemnation. Among us men who have gone against spinning machine guns single-handed and captured them volunteering for the job, among us are men who have ridden with dispatches through shell fire so dense that four men fell and only the fifth got through. Not one man of us ever disgraced the flag of a service. It is bitter to come home and to be called deserters and traitors. We are the same men who were on the, on the French front. Some of us fought in the Spanish War of 1898. Won't you tell the people of Massachusetts in which war you served, right? And, and here's the other thing. He, this is called out a, a really big thing, which is, um, which is that the working class man goes and fights for rich people's wars. They were basically like, "What war did you serve in, Governor Coolidge? That you get to call us deserters and traitors when we fucking upheld the flag when we were out there taking mortar fire? Which war were you in? Where were you at? Were you serving cushy in a fucking Senate job? Were you fucking?" Uh, budding up to 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 railway bosses, and they call out the media for lying too. The media, which was in support of the union before the strike, when they were trying to negotiate, they were in support of them. And then all of a sudden, the banker disappeared. Right, the banker was like, "Oh shit, they're striking. I better shut the fuck up." And you didn't hear from this banker ever again. You didn't hear from this banker about any of this shit. So the newspapers did what they normally do, which is they tow the line of the establishment. They tow the line uh, of, of the government in place. And they lied about them, calling them traitors and deserters and all these names, right? Agents of Lenin, the Bolsheviks, and all this other shit. And they called them out. They called out Governor Coolidge. Um, the... The unfortunate thing about them calling out Governor Coolidge as they did in in this where where am I? Yep, this one it's right here. <laughs> um, is it as unfortunately it didn't work? He still he still became uh, the 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 president uh, after after all of this, right? But but it's not just Woodrow Wilson. It's not just Governor Coolidge that's shitting. On the on the police union, that's 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 shitting on on people that are trying to like stand up for their rights, to stand up on the rights that they actually went and fought for, that they almost fucking died for, right? Uh, Senator Henry Cabot uh, looked at the uh, looked at all this, and he basically said that the AFL controlling the police would mean that it's communism, that that if a union represented, that if the police union joined the AFL, that they would be giving to communism. Because essentially that once again, the logic would be that the police would actually be serving the people. They would be represented by working class people coming together, adding their names to the negotiating table. So when the government decides to change laws and um, to, to be like the union would be a check and balances system. So if the legislative body is making, um, you know, legislative body in the judicial, body, they, they're making laws and upholding laws that. Uh, are are in no benefit to the working class person. The unions come in and they become the checks and balance system represented by the working class themselves and not somebody in a managerial position, not somebody in some sort of like higher up position um, and saying, well, this is unfair and here's why. And we deserve to be at the negotiating table. We deserve to have our voice represented when you're making decisions that affect our lives. Um, and that's apparently uh, communism 
and it's bad. It's a bad thing. If that's communism, fine, but it's not. Um, you know, so instead, you know, the senator is like, oh, we what well, we should have though is cops that listen to the government that uh, that are basically um, that are basically used as sort of this private authoritarian force of the government that if the government makes a law, no matter how ridiculous over the top or corporate friendly it is and how it fucks over the common man, uh, cops should just enforce it with whatever force we deem them to. So what they're accusing them, uh, what they're actually accusing them th of, of that they would do if they were part of a union is what they want them to do as part of a government force. That's what the senator is essentially advocating for. And that's kind of what the cops have become. Like we talked about earlier, right? Like they represent pipelines more than they represent people. Now, we did have a couple of Standing Rock cops uh, join in solidarity with the protesters there, but uh, I think it was about two of them. And, um, and we talked about that in an in a earlier uh, stream, right? Um, you know, the cops now are basically used as, uh, as a private army to protect your fallacies. I'm using the fallacies as a PH, like a, like a dick. Just in case if anybody uh, missed the joke. <laughs> the Ohio State Journal um, wrote a piece where they said that uh, they should revoke citizenship from any, uh, any striking cops. That if you go on strike, you should have your citizenship revoked from you. That's, that's insanity. I mean, that's authoritarian. All of this stuff is authoritarian. Um, and that's really what this is the sound of, right? Um, crime, you, have, you, have the Democrat, you have a Democrat who's the president at the time uh, saying that this is a crime against civilization. You have a Republican governor uh, who is calling them deserters, traitors, and agents of Lenin. You have a senator um, saying that uh, it, this would be the downfall of freedom and, and you know, it's, it's capitalism. You have, you have a newspaper uh, saying that you should revoke citizenship from striking cops. This is all the sound of capitalist corporate authoritarianism. And, and this is all still in effect today. Because if you go and stand up for the working class, all of these things are levied against you. All of these things are levied against you. What do they do to Bernie Sanders, right? What do they do to anybody that, that stands alongside Bernie Sanders? I'm not saying that Bernie is the be-all, end-all of a movement. I've always said that these politicians are kind of mascots. Um, and, and really the idea is what's important and, and the collective, uh, support of the idea is, is I think a, more important than, um, you know, just, um, uh, just the individual that leads it. I think the individual is important, but it, it, in terms of this, it's, it's, uh, it's about the idea. And this is where we are today. So, so if you're wondering why, um, there isn't a bigger police union presence, this is why. Because they levy these attacks against you, and when you become a cop, uh, if you don't, if you don't become the private military force of the establishment and uphold laws uh, to criminalize protests, as we see today, uh, because we because we are seeing that in New Orleans, a, if you um, critical infrastructure laws is what they are, uh, cops support critical infrastructure laws. If you are if you are going to uphold law and order, in my opinion, you should have the critical thought to sit there and say, "Hey, this seems to go against the First Amendment. Maybe we shouldn't. Maybe this is going down a pretty, um, pretty bad path here, right? Maybe criminalizing protesters uh, for saying that this pipeline is going to leak into a clean water supply, or into the soil, um, or into a nature preserve." or into cities itself, maybe we should listen. So I think if you're a cop and you believe in true law and order um, and you believe in this, this notion of freedom and in, in, in this notion of, um, of the Constitution and, and, and being you know, a protector of the public, 
uh, then you should go against laws like that. And you should be able to, you should be allowed to, one, unionize. Because that just means that you're part of the people. Um, and you will take, uh, take the side of people over the establishment. Uh, but two, I think you should have the foresight to look at a law and say that it's illogical. I think that should be the right of um, the police uh, in an ideal world. Um, and I've talked about this several times as well. I, I wrote a whole big piece about it, and I've talked about it in my stand-up a couple times. I'll probably talk about it in my stand-up again um, with more, you know, this information involved. Uh, that cops are traumatized. They have PTSD from just being cops themselves because the only thing they see is um, sort of the shitty end of humanity. You know, after the eighth person pisses on your shoe, you think everybody wants to piss on your shoe. And um, I'm not justifying the behavior or anything. I'm, I'm, I'm more recognizing where it comes from, right? Um, if cops are have PTSD just from the general notion of being cops, maybe we should fundamentally change that system. Maybe there's a lot of things within that system itself um, that once again, if you're going to treat cops like people, if you're going to uh, grant them the human rights that they deserve to be granted, uh, maybe the system should change. Maybe we should be fighting back for the system. And the reason why cops don't is because of what happened here in the 1919 uh, Boston police strike. Um, you know, you, 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 look at, you look at the way the media just treated them, where they, where they were in support of them. Four out of five, 80% of the media in Boston was in support of them. And then the day, of the, the day after the strike, they start uh, putting out the the red baiting and the uh, and the lies about them. So you know, if you want to know why cops aren't uh, on the side of the people, here's why. It's it's unfortunate. Um, it's unfortunate, but but the, uh, this this strike was an unfortunate loss uh, for the people. But but we made some pretty important stands, and there's there's a lot of major lessons that we can learn. Uh, from all this. Uh, one of them being that a Democratic president and a Republican governor that eventually becomes the president were, you know, basically in line and thought the same way, which shatters that illusion of the two party system being so different. Um, Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed this content, please give it a like and a subscribe and a share. Share it out with your friends, your enemies, whoever you think would enjoy content like this. I'm going to be putting out videos like this every single day. So make sure you are subscribed to the channel uh, and make sure you hit that bell so you get all the alerts from all the videos that I put out there. Uh, and, uh, and if you, if you have the means to, uh, please consider making a, a donation. I know we are all in tough times, but if you, if you can, uh, you can become a sustaining member or make a one-time donation at ramennoodlescomedy.com slash donate. You can check out various different ways of becoming a sustaining member or just make a one-time donation. Uh, while you're on my website, you can also check out all of my past comedy albums, which are available on all of your favorite streaming and uh, downloading websites, if that's, that's, if that's a way that you can you say that. Uh, <laughs> but they're also available on Bandcamp, which uh, right now is giving the most back to artists. Uh, but also on my Bandcamp, they are all available for a pay what you want. If you would like to enjoy some live stand-up comedy albums from me and you don't have the means, if you're in tough times, that's totally fine. You can download it for free. Go ahead and get it for free and enjoy it. Uh, or if you do, and if you want somebody else to enjoy it, you can get it to them as a gift. Uh, that's also a, a recommended thing. Uh, but most importantly, thank you guys for tuning into this video. Um, thank you guys for, for all the people that have already donated, that have already become patrons. I really appreciate it. You guys are amazing. And uh, until the next video, we'll see you on the road. Thank you, guys.